So our next speaker today is Dr. Jennifer Sparrow, and she's the mom of a current Penn State student and a future class of 2022 Penn Stater. She serves as the Senior Director of Teaching and Learning with Education, or with Technology, excuse me, at Penn State. Let's welcome Dr. Jennifer Sparrow. So good morning, everybody. It's a pleasure to be up here. It's been really fun to listen to the presentations already this morning. And I think you'll see a lot of the themes that you've heard already in the technology part woven into the discussion that we're going to have today. I'll be honest with you, when we started this discussion, I, um, uh, my boss said, could you do this for me? He's out of town today. Um, and so we talked about digital fluency and how we use that to empower 21st century digital citizenship. And I spent a lot of time thinking about this topic, trying to understand how to make that fit with an 18 to 22 year old crowd. Now, I'll be honest with you, I have a 20 year old and an 18 year old, again, a Penn State student and one who just sent in her um, acceptance check last week. So we're pretty excited about that. So I feel like not only do I live this in my daily life, but it is a part of the work that we do every day here at Penn State. And so I have a little bit of a challenge for you today. Um, which is that digital fluency is not necessarily just about 21st century digital citizenship, although I think it is and it ties nicely with what we talked about earlier this morning, um, but it's about cre preparing you to create big, bold problems. And think about that for a second. Very rarely do we tell you to go out and make problems. But what I want to have you think about today is how is it that we leverage the skills and opportunities that we provide you here at Penn State in order to be the creators of big, bold problems, not just the solvers of those problems, and I'll tell you why. So, the class of 2030, you've already heard this this morning, um, that is just, what, 12 years from now, if I do my math correctly. And what we heard earlier from Rose, I've got a little bit different number, Rose, that 85% of the jobs that are gonna be available in 2030 haven't been invented yet. So I wanna prove my point for just a second here and I want you to take a moment and think back to 2003. Many of you were probably in preschool or elementary school and I'm sure at some point in your early education somebody said to you, what do you wanna be when you grow up? So I just want you to think about that for just a second. I'm gonna bet that none of you said you wanted to be a drone operator or an offshore wind engineer or a data scientist, or a Lyft driver. Really, no kid, ever, no kid ever said, I want to grow up and be a 21st century taxi driver. I'm pretty sure of it. But these jobs are all the result of the creation of new problems. If we took any of these people that are working in these jobs today and put them into the past, they wouldn't have anything to do because the problems that their jobs solved didn't even exist yet. So let's go back for a moment to the wind engineer, and I want to talk about this for just a second. The, the big problem that we're trying to solve with wind engineering is how do we deliver clean, renewable, and cost-efficient energy at scale? So not only do we have an entirely new profession that's developed around that problem, solving that problem, we know that within wind engineering, we have folks that are flying drones to assess the health of the windmills. They're um, with those drones do it, taking pictures and those images are coming back and creating, um, being used to create 3D prints so we can think about what is next um, for, the, for these uh, windmills. And finally, we've got folks that are using cloud computing, big, big data to design these and they're cutting the time to design from what would take several weeks to what would take several hours now. So three jobs, again, drone operator, 3D printer and cloud architect that didn't exist before we had this problem of creating clean, reusable, efficient wind energy. So that's why I'm challenging you to create big problems today. If we in higher ed are doing our jobs right, we're providing you with opportunities to make big problems because again, you've heard this just before, that you'll never be more supported in making and doing what you're doing than you are today at Penn State. You can push the boundaries, you can fail in a really safe environment. You could take advantage of those resources we just heard about. You can solve those problems and hopefully make big problems even better. So my challenge to my colleagues here at Penn State is to provide you with the learning opportunities that will allow you to boldly address the challenges of the 21st, or hold your breath, even the 22nd centuries, if you think about it. We need to create opportunities for you to practice making and solving big problems. We want you at the end of your education here to be ethical decision makers 
critical thinkers, courageous leaders, and globally and culturally engaged. And we've heard about all of those things already this morning, which gives me great warmth in my heart. We want you to be prepared not just for the jobs of the future, although we saw that's why people come to college, to get those jobs. But we want you to be entrepreneurs, activists, researchers, and something near and dear to my heart, lifelong learners. We know from the statistics you saw earlier that students feel that they have specific skills. We know that the employers want specific skills. What we have pulled out of those um, AAC and U studies are a couple of things. We know that our future employers want critical thinkers, they want complex problem solvers, novel and adaptive thinkers, which is, goes back to that entrepreneurship. They want social intelligence, something we would have never talked about in my days in college. They want new media literacy, cognitive load management. How do you deal with all of those pieces that are coming in? How do you make good decisions? Um, how do you prioritize? And they want individuals who can contribute to innovation in the workplace. So how do we help you get there? How does Penn State help you get there? I believe it's through digital fluency. So what is digital fluency? And how do we help you get there? We've been talking about digital fluency for I don't know, probably about the last four years, we've been talking about digital literacy for probably 20 before that, so probably before most of you were born. Digital fluency is the, the ability to create new knowledge, to create new challenges, and to create new, big, bold problems, and have the skills that we heard before, critical thinking, complex problem solving, and social intelligence to solve those problems. So how is fluency different than literacy? Literacy is an understanding of how to use those tools. 20 years ago, if you talked about digital literacy, this would be, how do you type in a URL into a web browser? Here's how you click a mouse. I'm not joking. Um, fluency is the ability to use those tools to generate new knowledge. And so we've overcome the literacy piece of this. And I believe that you all do come to school technologically literate, digitally literate. Now we're talking about the fluency. How do you become creators of new knowledge? If you think about literacy and fluency in terms of learning a foreign language, literacy is the ability to read and write in that new language. Fluency is the ability to create something new, a conversation, a piece of poetry, or a story even. So what does digital fluency include and how does Penn State provide learners with opportunities to practice these things? I believe that digital fluency is an overarching category and there are several pieces that contribute to it, different fluencies that we can add. And they're intertwined. You've heard about some of them already. We'll talk about a few of them. And this certainly isn't a comprehensive list because I think this evolves over time. It evolves as we have new technologies, new areas and opportunities to be creators of big problems and new knowledge. So the first one I would challenge you with is a curiosity fluency. And this is the idea that I hope that you not only have questions, but that you also want to have answers to those questions. And that you understand that you don't need to just Google the answers to those questions, but that you can be creators of the answers of those questions. So we're doing this at Penn State today. We're providing opportunities through our, um, our design thinking commons, through the media commons, which are located at every campus, through the faculty development that we provide for, for faculty and helping them understand how to leverage design thinking in their classrooms, to provide students a safe pay place to think about how do you leverage design thinking to not only solve problems, but create those new problems. There's communication fluency. How many folks here have used a one-button studio? Yeah, right? So, easy, super easy, right? The idea that we leverage communication fluency to be able to communicate across diverse populations. It could be technologically or non-technologically mediated. It's about choosing the correct medium that is appropriate for your audience. It's about, at PSU, having access to the tools that you need in order to do those things. So the One Button Studio is one of those tools, right? It provides a low barrier of entry. You can get in and actually utilize those tools. You've got access to Adobe Creative Cloud. Um, and we can envision a new world where we're telling stories and uh, talking about our research in new and interesting ways. There's creation fluency. Sometimes it's called maker fluency. And it's an understanding of how to create and leverage your knowledge, leverage your knowledge to make something new. It can happen in both physical and virtual worlds. And we have in here programming fluency, which can include the creation of new apps and now through a knowledge of programming. Penn State has our Maker Commons here, which is available not only here at University Park, but available to every campus. We allow students access to 3D printing, and we use the interlibrary, interlibrary loan services to get those 3D prints out. 
You can see here our invention studio, which has um, maker, maker uh, little bits invention kits. And we're looking at a possible partnership to bring um, app programming languages and courses to all students regardless of major, so not just those STEM students. We have data fluency, which is the ability to use data sets and make informed decisions. We have understanding capabilities of the technology so you can push the boundaries of what it is you do and enable you to ask the right questions. And we have invent innovation fluency, which to me is the ability to risk, fail, learn, and iterate. A few years ago, Dr. Barron said, when students decided to come to Penn State and pay their tuition, they purchased a sports car, but too many of them will only drive it 20 miles per hour. Our job in higher ed is to help you look at the horizon, evolve our curricular and co-curricular learning engagements, and to provide Penn State learners with as many opportunities to learn, practice, and master those fluencies. Your mission, should you choose to accept it, is to keep an open mind and boldly embrace the opportunities so that you have the knowledge, skills, and abilities to find answers to the problems we don't even know exist yet, and to drive that sports car. I'm excited about the future. I hope you are too.